Well, here we are. Um, I didn't bring the hat, it wouldn't fit in the car, so. <laughs> no, actually the photograph is courtesy of Brother Elliot back there who uh, did a little uh, creative photoshopping. Um, and uh, when I saw it, I couldn't quit laughing. Imagine, it's the year 2156. We are looking at the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Moravian Music Foundation. What's going on in the Moravian music world around us? The usual disclaimer. The first picture notwithstanding, I am not a fortune teller. <laughs> I generally do not see the future. Rather, I have spent a lot of time examining the past, and I try to live in the present. And with those roots, I think we can find some insight to imagine what might be coming in the future. I'll tell you, first off, some things in Moravian music will remain the same. Participation. Singing by everybody who's present playing whatever instruments we have. Um, there are different versions of anthems by Johann Friedrich Peter from 200 years ago in the different collections because I think he had different instruments. There were different instruments available in Bethlehem than what were here at the same years. So he wrote a different version or took out the parts and did some minor rewriting the parts to make sure all the notes were there. So that we will be playing whatever instruments we have. We'll be keeping up with the latest trends in music. The 18th century Moravians often had copies of pieces in Europe, written in Europe only a few months after they were first published. They'd found their way here. So we'll still be doing that. We'll be using every kind of music there is. That's in our, that's in our DNA from 200, 300, 400 years ago. Whatever kind of music's out there, we're gonna be making use of it somehow. Somebody will be having fun with it. And the most important part is that Moravian music will be made by amateurs. What's the original root of the word amateur? It's not opposite of professional. The original root is lover. It'll be made by people like us who love the music. There will be professional musicians teaching and leading and encouraging and enabling. But music for Moravians in 2156 remains a participation thing. It is not a spectator sport. What else is going to be happening in 2156? Moravian music will have a worldwide focus. We won't just be looking on what's going on in Salem, what's going on in Bethlehem, what's going on in Tanzania. We will be looking worldwide. Moravian Music Foundation right now is working on a project of, to create a worldwide Moravian unity songbook. This book, we hope to have it out in about three years or under three years now, to have songs from every province of the Moravian unity. There are 24 of them now. Three, four, five songs from every province translated into as many languages as we can get um, with recordings. Um, it's going to be a challenge. I just got an email this morning from the music director of the Eastern West Indies province. I, I rejoiced when I got this email because what he said was, got your news about the Moravian Unity Songbook, we'll be happy to cooperate. I can send you music and words to songs, many Caribbean Moravian songs. Who do I send them to? And I sent, send them to me, send me music, send me words, send me something about the composer, send me what you know about the author. If they're still living, send me their contact information. If there are any copyright issues, let me know what they are. Send me everything you have, I can't wait. And then he said, how many can I send? And I said, let's go up to 10 of the ones that if people hear this, they think, or if people, if you ask your Moravians, what are Moravians in the Eastern West Indies singing? This is it. That's what we want. So he's gonna, that's gonna be just the start. The Unity Songbook will be just a start. And in 2156, they'll be looking back on that primitive early work of worldwide Moravian music. 2156, we will be writing words and music, lots of them. In our history, I have a theory 
that I've not done serious analysis on. It takes a, would take a lot more study than I think I'd have time to do in the remaining years of my life. Um, but my theory is that when the Moravians have been most prolific artistically in composing and writing words, they also have been most passionately engaged in mission. It seems that throughout our history, in the big flowerings of creativity and the big flowerings of mission work in the 16th century and in the 18th century, there was this immense explosion of new music and new words being written. At the same time, there was a passionate mission outreach that went around the known world. Brothers and sisters, I think we're there again now. I think we're starting one of those periods. I'm seeing a lot of new Moravian music being written and new words being written. And they're being written by amateurs, by people in the pew, as well as by, but we're, they're being written by people who are not professional poets or professional theologians or professional musicians. They're being written by people who love Jesus and want to write about it. And I think what's happened in our history is that the more you write and sing about loving Jesus, the more you have to share that. And the more you share it with people and get up to see other people coming to know the Savior and being excited about it, the more you want to sing it. So I think they feed off each other. I think we're in the beginning years of one of those phases in our history. In 2156, we'll still be enjoying that, that outgrowth, the outgrowth and the results of this. Composers will still write using the daily text. Daily text will be, what, 400 and some years old then. 420 some years. They'll still be writing using the daily texts. Um, pastors and lay people will continue to write music for their current needs. For congregational singing or house church singing, whatever the church, wherever, whatever the church looks like in another 140 years. I don't know what that's going to be, but people will be writing songs, music in the language, the musical language of that day for the use of people in worship, for their specific needs. Now I occasionally get um, hymns written by pastors who said, I wanted a hymn to talk about this scripture, to reflect on this scripture that was in the lectionary, and I couldn't find one, so I wrote it. That's going to keep happening. People are still going to be writing. Hymns are the expression, or any congregational song, I think is the expression in today's language, whatever today is, of the unchanging truths of the love of God. God loves us, that doesn't change. Jesus saves, that doesn't change. The Holy Spirit gifts, that doesn't change. The way we talk about it changes over time. And so people will need, in 2156, they will need new words to say those same truths. So what else is gonna happen in 2156? There will be performing groups we don't know what they're going to look like. Probably be some brass instruments. Probably trombone choirs. Probably a church band. Probably Moravian lower brass will still be playing. But we don't know what that's going to look like. 200 years ago, the modern brass band wasn't possible. 200 years ago, what we know is the valved brass instruments hadn't been invented yet. So the trombone choir was the ensemble that could have soprano, alto, tenor, bass parts played by the same instrument by amateur players. To get the melody line on a brass instrument without any valves and without a slide, you gotta have an incredible lip. You gotta be playing way up high in the overtone series, which is very challenging, which limited in the 18th century, it limited that kind of playing to the professionals. 19th century invention of the valve uh, meant that amateur players could play brass instruments. That led to the brass on tradition we have now. So what other inventions are going to come up? What other instruments might there be in 2156? I don't know what's coming. I have no concept of what, what, the, what ensembles might be around in 2156. I can't even begin to imagine. In 2156, the northern province will have adapted the southern province's tradition of using a full band for any kind of Moravian <laughs> occasion we can use. Um, that hasn't been a northern province tradition. When I visited uh, Moravian churches in Ohio 
26, 27 years ago, um, some people asked, you know, we use our brass choir um, for Easter, but we had a, a, a clarinet player who really wanted to play in the Easter band, and what do I do? I said, you say yes. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but they were very uncomfortable with that. Bethlehem uses the Bethlehem Trombone Choir for festival occasions, but they don't have a full band tradition at all. They're beginning one. Um, there was the first time we'd seen this happen, the first, we get the, we get the emails, us band players, we get the emails for funerals or special occasions or something, and you just show up with your horn and play. That's not been happening in the North. It did in August for the Bethlehem Area Moravians annual picnic. Uh, Brother Alan Frank sent an email out to all the band players of all the instruments that he knew and said, let's just get together and have a pickup band at the Bethlehem Area Moravians picnic. Let's just try this and see what happens. They had 30 some players show up, including hand drums and an accordion. The accordion was played by Rick Santee, who, by the way, chairs uh, Eastern District and sometimes Northern Province Synods, and he always pulls his accordion out at some point during Synod and plays Sing Hallelujah on the accordion. It's amazing. It works. So anyhow, the Northern Province in 2156, they'll have a full band tradition that, that dates back to the early 21st century. <laughs> so Moravian music in 2156 will be focused as it is now on worship of the Savior. Moravian music, past and present, is grounded and rooted, grows and bears fruit within and for the worship of the Savior. What about instrumental music just for fun? What, how does that go? Yes, it does, because the instrumental music in our past tradition was played by the same people who were playing for Sunday worship, and they were playing symphonies and sonatas and quartets and the like to help hone their skills for Sunday morning within the context of their worshiping community. So every musical manifestation in our Moravian past is somehow related to our worship of the Savior, and I think that's going to stick around with us. So that's just a few thoughts about Moravian music in another 140 years. What about the Moravian Music Foundation at 200? That's kind of fun. What things will be different and what will remain the same? In 1994, Moravian Music Foundation Board of Trustees held their first long-range planning retreat. Brother Gary Harkey from the Northern Province facilitated the retreat and he stood in front of us the first night and he said there's two things that I want you to remember. One of these you're going to hear again. You're going to hear both of them again. First thing he said was, good enough never is. Don't go for good enough. Go for excellence. And the second thing he said that we all gasped at. In 1992, we were a small organization without a northern province office that was struggling to pay its ordinary bills. Uh, and what he said was, go ahead, do it. Set big, hairy, audacious goals. And we did. 1994, the Moravian Music Foundation Board of Trustees set some big, hairy, audacious goals, things like let's microfilm the whole collection for security in case something happens to the, the 1916 wood frame house we were living in at the time. Um, let's open a Bethlehem office so we can study the music up there a little easier. Two thirds of the music we're custodians of lives in the Moravian archives in Bethlehem. Let's start a recording series of the works of the major Moravian composers. You want to talk about big, hairy, audacious goals for an organization that's having trouble paying the light bill? Let's build a new state-of-the-art archival facility. So they set these big four or five huge goals that we had no clue how we could ever meet any of them. Over the next months, they prioritized them. What's the most important thing to do first? The most important thing they chose was to microfilm the music collections because that's the basis for all of our other study and research. Let's get a microfilm so that if, heaven forbid, the wood frame house burns down and the vault gets flooded, we have the contents of that collection. So those microfilms were done over the course of the next two or three, three four years. We set a goal, we started raising funds, we were gifted with some uh, generous unexpected bequests and the collections got microfilmed. Copies of that film are in um, Bethlehem, here in Salem, and in Herrenhut, Germany. 
So we, we then, at that time, set big, hairy, audacious goals. We have done so since then. Our most recent one we're still working on is to get our entire collection catalog online. Um, we're getting close. That is turning into a project. When we first started the project, we thought it was going to be maybe a $300,000 project and take two years. We're in year five, and by the time we're done with this, we, we're going to have raised and spent a million dollars. Talk about a big, hairy, audacious goal. We will still, in another 150 years, the Music Foundation will be setting big, hairy, audacious goals that it has no idea how it's going to fund or carry out. That's part of the energy of this group now. Moravian Music Foundation will still be, and this is related to the previous slide, non-profit in every sense of the word. <laughs> we'll still be struggling to find the funds to meet those big, hairy, audacious goals. The Board of Trustees was a little uncomfortable about 10 or 12 years ago when I said, I, I didn't plan to say this, it just kind of sort of came out. You know, if we ever find ourselves uh, running a surplus on our budget, don't worry, I'll take care of that really quickly. <laughs> So I said, if we got extra money, I'm going to spend it. We got a mission to, to fulfill. And they're kind of going, <laughs> we will still be nonprofit. Um, it is not our job to raise money to put in the bank. It is our job to raise money to fulfill those big, hairy, audacious goals. Foundations musicologists and employees and board members will still be trying to bridge the chasm between the ac academic world and the church world. There's a tension there. Um, there is mistrust sometimes between those in the academic world and those that work for the church. Uh, many people in the academic world are afraid that sincere faith colors one ab one's ability to make objective academic judgments. Um, I ran into that in working on my book, The Music of the Moravian Church in America, with, with the copy editors. Towards the end of the book, they questioned some of the statements in the book. They said, this is too much a statement of faith. You're not supposed to be talking about your faith. And I gave them a couple of them. I said, all right, I'll rewrite this. How's this for a way to do it? No, that's not, that is my personal faith, but this is not here as a statement of faith. This is here because that's the way the church works out of which this music came. I will not give on that one. They said, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, but that, that mistrust is there, and there are many in the church who mistrust higher education. Oh, there are many who feel that you really don't need an academic degree, a high degree. Oh. That's not as true in the Moravian Church as in other denominations, at least I haven't seen it. But there is still a tension between the church and the academic world, and I think that probably will still be there. So we'll still be working to bridge that gap and, and help both sides understand each other. There need be no gap between deep and sincere faith and responsible scholarship. The two are not in conflict with each other. In 2156, the Moravian Music Foundation will be, in North America, will be part of an association or federation of Moravian music foundations worldwide. And the oldest, the second oldest, we will be the oldest, the oldest will be the one in South Africa, founded in the first quarter of the 21st century by South African organist and scholar Devandre Bunzair. He has been at the last two Moravian Music Festivals. He completed his doctorate earlier this year, and his topic was a survey and study a catalog of the music of living South African Moravian composers and the need for a Moravian Music Foundation in South Africa. And he modeled his plan on us, and he would like to see that happen. There is Moravian music, older Moravian music, in South Africa as well. There's a significant body of Moravian music in Labrador, we don't know what there is written down in Tanzania, but we know there's a lot of Moravian music being sung there. Uh, there is Moravian music, crazy amounts of Moravian music in Germany and the Czech Republic and Poland. Uh, most, much of that is cataloged, but there's nobody there dedicated to its study and research the way we are. I think there will be Moravian music foundations. That's pretty exciting. Uh, In 2156, scholars will be angry that the 21st, 20th century technicians invented music notation software. Scholars will hate it. Scholars hate it now because what you don't have is anybody's compositional sketches. 
For Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you have his sketchbooks where he wrote down what he was thinking about, and you can trace the evolution of the themes of that piece back to his original thoughts. Now, with so many people composing at the computer, they rewrite over the old version. The old version's gone. All you see is the finished product. So scholars and musicologists are going to go bananas in frustration that they don't have the information about 20th and 21st century Moravian composers that they have about the 18th century ones. They're not going to like that. Because in, the, in 2156, they're going to be studying the works of revered 20th and 21st century Moravian composers like Jill Bruckert and Brian Henkelman. Wade Peoples will still be loved because in, as of 2019, Wade Peoples will still composing using pencil and paper and has sketchbooks. Somebody else has to transcribe his music into the computer. Scholars will wish that gifted composers like Steve Gray could have written down his songs as he was writing them instead of having somebody else transcribe them into the computer. Steve Gray's music, what if Steve Gray's music is written down was played into a portable tape recorder. I have the, the songs of his that are in Sing to the Lord a New Song. I wrote them down. I transcribed them from a little portable tape recorder. He sat in my office and played them and sang them for me. Gave me the words, the basic chords, and played them. So scholars will wish he could have written them down himself by hand. Scholars will be doing doctoral studies on those 20th and 21st century Moravian people, composers and their works, and they'll be coming to grips with the variety of musical language used in those in the 20th and 21st century. Wade Peoples and Steve Gray's writing is nothing like each other. You would never guess that they live within a few miles of each other and are only a few years apart in age, and both are members of the Moravian church. You would never guess by their musical styles. Uh, same with Dirk French, Dirk French and Jill Bruckert. Their musical styles are a little more similar, but still very different from each other. Um, so scholars will be studying this and trying to figure out how come they lived at the same time and were in communication with each other and their music sounds so very different. Did they not learn from each other? They didn't copy each other? Now remembering that in the 18th century, imitation is, was the sincerest form of flattery. And to take another composer's theme and incorporate it into your work was an act of homage for that composer. Not now. Now it's a copyright infringement. In 2156, the staff will still be paging through boxes of miscellaneous unidentified parts. We have several of those here and several in Bethlehem. One page of a viola part without a title. Yeah. The second half of the soprano part of some piece, but you have no idea what the first half is. I go through those boxes every three or four years, and occasionally I recognize something. I go, oh, that. That's the second violin part to this. I recognize it now, because I'd worked on that piece from other sources. But the, every time I take one page out, three or four more come in. There's going to be a lot more of those. Um, in, the 20, for in 2156, Scholars will be saying, what was it with worship styles in America in the 20th and 21st century? You've got some that sing four-part hymns all the time. You've got some that project just the words of what is, what is in the 21st century called contemporary Christian. I don't know what they'll call it 150 years from now. Uh, I kind of resent the term contemporary Christian as a description of music style. Why? Because I'm a Christian and I live now, which makes me contemporary, but I don't write in a pop style. The contemporary Christian tag is reserved for those who write in a popular or more rock style, and that's not me. But I am a living Christian composer, so there needs to be a different term. But scholars and researchers and historians of religion will be struggling to try to say, how could you have been Moravian in Winston-Salem and your worship be so different from this other Moravian church that's three miles, that was, that was three miles from you? How is that? How was that? How did that work? Uh, in 2156, the Music Foundation will still be working with the Salem Congregation and the Moravian Archives to keep the Archie Davis Center, now respected as a 155-year-old structure, well-maintained, clean, 
and safe as a place to store the growing collection of archival treasures. Right now, for our first 18 years here, it's been pretty low maintenance. There has been a paintbrush carried through the building. It was carried to the upper porch when we painted the chairs. But there's been no interior painting in this building. There's been no carpet cleaning. The original heating air conditioning system is still working. Um, the original elevator is still working. There have been repairs here and there. Um, but there's not been any kind of major equipment overhauls and no major redecorating. That's not going to be true in another 140 years. Who knows? I don't know what the entrance will look like then. Maybe they will have actually paved that little circle around the um, fountain here. So, but who knows? But the archives and the Music Foundation will still be struggling to keep it working and to keep it thriving and to keep the building the safe place that it is for the storage of the treasures that are here and for the interpretation for visitors and scholars. However, in 2156, the vault might be closer to full. We might have had to install that kind of compact shelving that, where the, the big old shelves roll. We might have had to by then. We will have had to come to grips better than we are now with how do you store things that come in electronically. Um, how do you store electronic data? It's risky. Um, when we microfilmed the collection these 20 some years ago, we chose microfilm over digital data storage because then the state of the art storage medium was a little three and a half inch floppy disk that could fit about two pictures on it. We'd have had a room full of floppy disks to store the music on there. It would have had to have been migrated to later technology three or four times by now. And when you migrate from one technology to the next, you lose some of the resolution. I, had to, I spent what, $15, $19 including shipping, to buy a little piece of equipment I can plug into my computer that will actually read one of those three and a quarter inch disks. Because we got a couple in that people have brought us stuff in and I want to know what's on them. The archives is struggling now or has been, has just sort of shaken their head in despair over the monster reel-to-reel -reel tapes from the 1970s. Excuse me, not discs, not tapes. Monster discs from the 1970s that have treasures off, provincial treasures office, office records. But by then, by 2156, we'll be struggling with how to store all that. Right now, my, I gotta, gotta confess, my technique right now says if it's worth keeping, it's worth printing out and storing as paper. Paper is still remains the most stable technology we have. I can still read the 1544 hymnal. Didn't have to be migrated to a different technology. I don't have to plug it in. I don't have to make sure it's charged up. I just have to keep the book safe. In 2156, researchers will still be looking for those three clarinet concertos by Christian Latrobe. <laughs> we know he wrote them. We know they were played in Nazareth, Pennsylvania in the early 19th century. We just don't know where they are. So maybe I'll be wrong. I hope I'm wrong about that. I want those to turn up. By the way, we also know that John Antes wrote a set of string, four string quartets. We don't know where those are either. Carl Kroger has a theory that the string quartets or that the string trios that we do have are arrangements of the quartets without the viola. And he makes a very compelling argument. I hope he's wrong. I want those quartets to turn up. Maybe we'll still be looking for the clarinet concertos. By the way, if you haven't heard me say this before, we know, also know that Latrobe wrote in a letter to his daughter towards the end of his life about those concertos. And he said, I can't believe I could ever play them. They're hard. <laughs> That's why I really want to find them. In 2156, the foundation will be technologically savvy, but somewhat behind <coughs> the curve. There's an early 20th century, uh, 2001 book that the foundation um, is working, that I'm working with now, and the foundation will have taken one particular piece of advice in this book to heart. The book is Good to Great by Jim Collins. He writes that with regard to any new technology, an organization should take some time to reflect rather than just jumping on and say, oh, this is a new technology, let's take it. What Jim suggests is that if a technology is key to our mission, yes, then we adopt it and we strive to become the best in the world at it. If a technology is okay but not key, not necessary to our mission, then maybe we'll adopt it but we're not going to try to be on the forefront. We're, we're not going to sweat it. We're going to use what makes good of it. But this is something that the foundation has been doing already. The 
Ni the uh, 1960s catalogs, the, the cataloging that was done in 1960s was done by the latest technology of the day, the card catalog. And they did it better than anybody else. The cataloging project we're in now, yes, the million dollar project, uh, is being done to the current technology of the day, the latest technology of library cataloging and linking between uh, WorldCat, an OCLC library database and RISM, an archival database, linking between the two and we are at the front, we are at the pushing the edge of the envelope. Dave and Barbara have taken that technology and are pushing it to new levels and teaching the staff at OCLC and RISM how to do what it is that we are doing. So we will, we will still use the technology. If the technology isn't critical to our mission, then good enough really might be good enough. If it is critical to the mission, oh man, we're going all the way. So I see our, the technology going towards helping us keep the music, helping us to see and make music, and helping us to hear music. Those are the things, all of it's related to our mission. In the 20, 2156, there will still be new discoveries of old music. Somebody will have gone through the basement of the granddaughter of Moravian composer Jill Bruckert and found pieces in manuscript form or on the computer that none of us knew she had written. And they will be discovering those and bringing them out and we'll be really excited about them. Somebody will turn up a box of music or they'll turn up a compact disc that says Dirk French anthems. Then we'll have to dig down and try to find a CD player that we can play this thing on. In 2156, the foundation will still be focused on our primary mission, preserving, sharing, and celebrating Moravian musical culture. Moravian musical culture is an evolving thing. It covers now 500 plus years, 550 plus years. By then it will cover 600, 700 years. So. There will still be Moravian musical culture. And the Moravian Music Foundation, I think, will work on this mission, <laughs> adhering to core values that the foundation is discussing and working with now. And those are, the core values are, Moravian music nourishes the soul and fosters faith. So what we are doing is worth doing. Number two, the person is always more important than the music. Relationships are more important than an absolute standard of excellence. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If we were to find, for instance, which we have not, and I have no reason to believe we will, if we were to find that in the middle of the 19th century, African Americans were writing music here in Salem and the elders in Salem burned it, if we were to find that out, we'd tell it. I hope we don't. I'd love to know that, that the Africans in Salem were writing music, and I'd love to have it. But I have no evidence of that. Uh, but we'd tell the truth. This is what we must do, is work with that integrity. And then, still, good enough never is. Good is good. Good enough is okay for the technology that's not key to your mission. Good enough in everything we strive for isn't good enough. Now, when I'm talking about excellence, though, what about things like recordings that are made by amateur players? They're not all going to be as excellent as the recordings that we pay a professional group out of New York or somebody to do. But the recordings that we make with our local players and singers, our amateurs, our lovers, will be to the highest standard of excellence that they are able to achieve. And that shows. When you hear our low brass recordings, you might hear a, a little gurgle of water in a horn, or you might hear a note that's not quite in tune. You will hear the love. You will hear the passion and the commitment of those players. So in other words, the Moravian music, our core values are Moravian music, it's worth doing, relationships, truthfulness, and excellence. I think those are still going to be core values that we're living by in another 150 years. Of course, I don't know what's coming in another 140, 150 years. I don't, you know, the hat notwithstanding. Uh, but I am excited about the future of Moravian music. I'm excited about the future of Moravian worship and the Moravian Music Foundation. 
I think another 140, 150 years isn't long enough for Moravian music or the Music Foundation to have finished their usefulness on God's good earth. As long as we stay true, true to that mission, I think the Music Foundation will continue to thrive and I think Moravian music will continue to, to flourish. So that mission, that, will, that the, 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 the purpose of Moravian music in general, it's grounded and rooted, grows and bears fruit within and for the worship of the Savior. The Music Foundation preserves, shares, and celebrates Moravian musical culture by holding to those core values. Our music nourishes the soul and fosters faith. The person is more important than the music. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and good enough never is. So, I thank you kindly for being here today and listening to some projections and some dreams and thoughts about the distant future. Uh, next month, next month, we're about Miss Adelaide, aren't we? So Nicole will be speaking about uh, Adelaide Freeze, former archivist and legendary person of legendary repute in the Moravian church, well-deserved repute. 